This is Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor. I'm gonna give everyone a few minutes to jump on because I know this is a really important topic for a lot of people. Um, and I wanna make sure everyone hears it from the start that wanted to jump, jump on this call. And there have been a lot of pet loss lately um, with clients, with ourselves. And I know this is a very important topic. And unfortunately, all of us as pet parents will experience this at some point. And a lot of us don't know how to grieve and manage our grief. And we're told by a lot of people on how we should do that, which isn't always necessarily the safest or the most appropriate um, advice. So we're gonna go through that. And I also, I wanted to hold a sacred space for everyone that's here. And I have a lot of pictures and I might get emotional. So that is my disclaimer at the front. Um, as pet parents, I think everyone understands. And I wanted to do this in memory of Finn and for everyone who's lost a beloved pet because they are truly a family member. So the fact that my voice is already cracking, hang in there with me. So let me share my screen with everyone. And I see quite a few of you jumping on, which is great. And at the end of this, I'm gonna do my best. I think I can have you guys, if you wanna say anything, you can, I'll share, I'll share your, uh, the screen with you. So if you wanted to say something, you can. If not, that's okay. There are a couple resources that are in the presentation that I will email to you afterwards that you can use, that will go through, that can help you with the transition with your pets. But if you have questions along the way, or comments, anything, leave them in the comment section below. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen. And I'll make sure we answer all of those at the end. And everyone who wants to say something can. And remember, this is sacred space. There is no judgment. Um, and I want everyone to feel comfortable and feel the sense of community that I hope this brings to you. So we are talking about grieving the loss of a pet. And as I just mentioned, every single pet parent will go through this at some stage. And this is the hardest stage. It's the stage we, we don't want to come to. It, you know, unfortunately it's a fact of life and they don't live as long as we do. However, I'm hoping that you can take some comfort and joy in the precious memories that we develop with them. So there are a lot of pictures of Finn. And so we're gonna try not to cry during the entire show, but we'll go from there. So I wanted to start with a, a, a poem. And this is actually one of the things that was given to me by a client right after Finn passed. And I thought it was very appropriate for everyone on this webinar. And maybe it resonates with you or you have other poems that um, resonate more with you, but it's called Paw Prints Left By You. You no longer greet me as I walk through the door. You're not there to make me smile, to make me laugh anymore. Life seems quiet without you you are far more than a pet. You are a family member, a friend, a loving soul I'll never forget. It will take time to heal for the silence to go away. I still listen for you and miss you every day. You are such a great companion, constant, loyal, and true. My heart will always wear the paw prints left by you. Obviously that touches me. <laughs> so I hope that you find some comfort in that. Um, and the memories that your pets will always share in your heart. And even though we can never replace them, they never go away, they're always with us. So as most of you know, I'm Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor. I love what I do. I'm a holistic veterinarian. I do acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine. And my main mission is to make sure that pets know that holistic medicine is available. This is why Finn lived so long after being diagnosed with a brain tumor and not everyone knows about it or is offered this as a service. So this is how Finn will live on in our mission. It is my mission to make sure everyone knows there are other treatment options, especially when you're told there's nothing more that you can do. We're gonna talk about grief and what those different stages look like. What are some of the exercises and the support that you can do for yourself and for other pets and then of course, we're gonna go into the pet memorial and remembering our loved ones. And then I'm gonna leave you with some resources. All of you are going to be emailed this so that you can rewatch it, or if you just need to go to the resource section, you can. And then as I mentioned, you will be emailed some of those resources too for uh, printing out and working through some of the exercises we're gonna talk about. First, 
First off, it's okay to not be okay. I want you all to just take a moment, take a deep breath. Now let's continue together and share this space. So what is grief? Grief is the response to loss. It is a normal response. Every journey is gonna be different for every person. So my grief process is not gonna look the same to yours. And remember that's okay. And it's okay to not feel okay. I don't feel okay, I'm obviously crying. And that's okay. We have to give ourselves the grace that we are experiencing grief over the loss of our beloved pet. By physically showing your grief, you're actively mourning your pet. This is, we have to go through this process. Let's talk about what the five stages of grief look like. So these can be experienced in any order and you may move in and out of each one of them. It can occur while you're caring for a terminally ill pet or and after their death. The stages can last minutes or months and they are simply responses to feelings and you may feel all of them or some of them or other feelings entirely like anxiety. So that first stage is denial. And this helps us survive the loss. It allows us to pace our grief so we don't become overwhelmed and it gives us time to process. I can tell you personally, when Finn was diagnosed with cancer, this was a big stage of grief for me. I didn't think it was possible he could have cancer after going through cancer with our other two pets. Anger is another stage of grief, and this is necessary to create a bridge to other emotions and give us temporary strength. Who here has felt anger over their pet being diagnosed with cancer or another chronic illness or something like that? I know I have. And what it does, it gives you that strength to move on. And we eventually, hopefully, move past that anger. And then bargaining. And this is a way to avoid the pain, and it keeps us in the past. Depression. This is what we start to feel when we move into the present. It's a normal and appropriate response. And tell you right now, there is a lot of depression in my world right now. Not seeing Finn, he would be actually sitting behind me right now. And that's really hard. So it's normal though. Remember, this is normal to feel this way. And then acceptance. So this is moving into the space of appreciating what we had. Remembering the good times and the joy. Focusing on how lucky we are to feel such a loss because we had so much love in our life going through those photos, going through those videos, even though it may create a lot of tears, those are amazing memories that our pets were able to give us, so embrace that. And I added gratitude. This is huge. This is moving into that space of appreciating what we had, remembering the good times and joy, and we're focusing on how lucky we are to feel such the loss because we had so much love. So, Remembering when we begin to accept everything that's happened, we begin to live again, and we cannot do so until we have given grief that time. So a lot of times we have to go through this acceptance into the gratitude phase, and it takes a varying amount of time for different people. You might not feel normal or okay again. However, that doesn't mean like getting a new pet is going to replace the old one. We still have, they're always, our hearts are broken when we lose these animals. They are such a big impact in our life and that's okay. It's a new normal and that's something that acceptance is going to help you come into. So don't deny those feelings. Listen to them and listen to how we need to move and how we need to change and grow and evolve. So what should I do? This is a big one for me right now. So your journey of grief will not take on a prescribed pattern or look like stages. So during this period, when you're actively mourning your loss, it may help to consider some of these following. Acknowledging the reality of the death. So this can take weeks to months, but will be done in the time that is right for you. We have to be kind to ourselves as we accept that new normal of that life without that beloved pet. And this is gonna look different. You might still have other pets that are mourning right alongside of you. But it's, it's, it's important to remember that it took time to build that relationship with your pet. And so it's going to take time to getting used to them not being there. 
moving towards that pain of the loss. So experiencing and allowing yourself to experience those emotional thoughts and feelings about the death of your pet, it's a difficult need, but an important one. So a healthier grief journey may come from taking your time to work through those feelings rather than trying to push them away or ignore them. Let the tears come. It's okay to be sad. That is part of the grieving process. And we're able to get back to a functional state the sooner that we embrace that. So continue your relationship through those memories. Your memories allow your pet to live on in you. Embracing those memories, both happy and sad, can be a very slow and at time painful process that occurs in steps. So some of the things that you can do for this process is looking at past photos, looking at videos. I feel very thankful and grateful that we have about 2 million photos and videos of Finn, so stay tuned for that if you follow this, us on social media. But writing a tribute to your pet, honoring their life and what they were able to give to us in our lives. That can make you feel better and help heal a broken heart. And writing, write your pet a letter. So recalling your time together. Those can be really fun things that you can do. And a lot of people will get memorial stones with their names engraved on that stone. So it can be in the garden, planting a tree for them, planting some flower or something that will always be there that will remind you of their life and the growth and what they, what they gave back to us. Those can be really, really helpful. And then adjusting your self-identity. So part of our self-identity might come from being a pet parent. Others might think of you in relationship to, or relation to your pet. So this is a big one for me. I don't have a pet in my house right now. This is the first time in how old, 36 years, I don't have a pet in my house. It's a really weird new identity for me and I don't like it. It's not going to be long. I know that, but I'm not ready for another one yet. However, that's, it's a weird thing being a veterinarian, not having a pet. It's like, what's wrong with me? And it's okay. It's okay to allow myself the time to heal my heart and heal myself before I bring another beloved animal into this house. Also, we were known on the street as the crazy German shepherd owners that had this crazy dog that was over exuberant. So you might be known by neighbors. And I tell you what, walking without Finn, super hard and very emotional. And our neighbors see us without a dog. And of course they're gonna ask and it brings up a whole new array of emotions. So adjusting to this change is a central need of mourning. Search for meaning. So when a pet dies, it's natural to question the meaning and purpose of pets in your life. Like, why is this happening? Why would this happen to me? Um, maybe you're experiencing other loss of life um, in, in your life or in your family and friends. And coming to terms with these questions is another need you must meet during your grief journey. Know that it is the asking, not the finding of concrete answers that is important. And this was something that to be completely open and honest with everyone here. While Finn started having seizures was the day that my dad went into hospital and my grandma fell and broke her hip. Not a great time in my life. And one of the things that I feel like a meaning for Finn just doing so amazingly well and having a few bad days where he wasn't gonna come out of his seizures from his brain tumor, I felt like he had to give his energy so that my other family members could live and now his energy lives on in them. I don't know if that's true or real or whatever, but I feel like it didn't all happen just because. So that's, it's something where, you know, find, just search for that meaning, but don't always go back and blame yourself because that's something that we can do is, you know, if I had with Finn, what if I waited another day, maybe he would have pulled out of it. Knowing the hard part being a veterinarian and a pet parent, knowing that what he's going through, like I knew, I knew it was time. But however, questioning that is so hard and we all do it. Even I did it as a veterinarian with my own pet. And then receiving support from others. You need the love and support of others because you never get over grief. Your heart is broken. They leave a hole. You get other pets and they help fill that hole, 
Those pets are very special in their own unique way. No one will ever replace Finn. No one will ever replace the cats we've had. Um, so talking or being with other pet parents who've experienced the death of a pet and can relate like a community like this is very important to your healing. And it's something that we have to do because everyone on this call understands and they don't judge, they listen. And that's very important. So other things to remember, the deafening silence. So especially if you don't have other pets in the house, I have never experienced this. And it is something I talk a lot about in social media because this sucks. Let's just put it bl like point blank. The silence in your home after the loss of a pet, it's excruciating loud. So while your animal companion occupies physical space in your life and your home, many times their presence is felt more with the senses. When that pet's no longer there, their lack of presence, so the silence becomes piercing. It becomes the reality of the presence of the absence. So merely being aware of the stark reality will assist you in preparing for the flood of emotions and the, that flood comes. So every day, especially being stuck at home, so that's a new thing too, is not being able to serve pets through acupuncture and house consultations and being stuck at home. Finn for me personally was my work breaks. I'd go down, I would pet him, we'd go outside, take a 10 minute break, uh, play with his toys, go for a walk, you know, late afternoon. Um, every time I go down the stairs to get water, he's, you know, sleeping on his mat or looking at me or, and I'd go and pet him. There's nothing there now. That's a very different life for us. So the special bond with your pet. So the relationship shared with your pet is a special and unique bond. And it's a tie that a lot of people find it difficult to understand. You're going to have well-meaning friends and other family members who think it's crazy how much you mourn for your, your pet. And they tell you, you shouldn't be grieving as hard. This is crazy. This is ridiculous. Your grief is normal. And the relationship you shared with your special pet needs to be mourned. Some people mourn pets harder than they mourn a family member. And when we think about these crazy little creatures in our house, think about the things that we let them do and get away with. I know if I'm in the bathroom, right? Let's take this one for example. Let's get real. If you're in the bathroom, if my husband walks in, I'm going to get out of here. What are you doing? If I'm sitting there going to the bathroom and my dog or my cat walks in, I'm like, oh, you're so sweet. I love you. Like, we don't let people do that to us, but we'll let our animals do that. So thumbs up, comment if you, if you feel the same way, you know, that that's why we can't allow others to tell us how much to grieve for our pets especially if they're not pet parents. They don't understand that special bond that we have. The other thing is, is grief can't be ranked. This is huge. So sometimes our heads get in the way of our heart's desire to mourn by trying to justify the depth of our emotion. So some people want to rank that grief. So pitting their grief emotions with others who may be worse. And while this is normal, your grief is your grief. And it deserves the care and attention of anyone who is experiencing a loss. This is something that I personally experienced. I'm just going through some of the things that I've had because I've we've lost three pets now to cancer. So two other cats that we lost, I can tell it was very difficult. One very suddenly, the other one was like a six month period. We did chemotherapy. Like we knew the time was coming and it was still very hard and very difficult. And I mourned them very differently than I'm mourning Finn right now. And that's okay. If I ranked my grief to how I responded to those, those cats or other pets, like I could become really down on myself. And that's not okay to do to yourself. So remember, have grace, allow yourself to feel all the feelings because it's normal and it's okay. What you're feeling is normal. And then questions of spirituality. So during this time in your grief journey, you may find yourself questioning beliefs regarding pets and the afterlife. And many people around you will also have their own opinions. We all don't believe in heaven, but we all see like rainbow bridge poems and all sorts of things. Like when we pass away and I go to heaven, like all my pets are gonna greet me. Not everyone believes in that. And so it's important during this time for you to find the answers that are right for you and your individual and personal beliefs. And you know, God bless everyone.
you know, whether you believe in God or not, like we're all allowed to have our own beliefs. That's what makes us amazing as a community. And so respect that. And if someone says something to you, that's okay. The way you feel and the way you believe and the way you feel like the aftermath of your pet passing is okay. Some people think that they come back in another pet's form and that's, that's great. So remember that this is part of it and you might come up against some people questioning your spirituality um, your grief, if it's like, is it deep enough or, you know, that special bond with your pet. These are all things that might come up when you're grieving for a lost pet. What about other pets in grief? A lot of people don't think pets have emotions and I can tell you that's very wrong. Um, so your other pets in the household, they can grieve over their lost companions. I can tell you that our our first cat that passed away was a very dominant cat and he was kind of a jerk. And I didn't realize how much his jerkiness affected our other cat. And she like blossomed after he passed. So she did not mourn Stanley and that's okay. However, there's a lot of pets that will actually mourn the other pets because they have a tight bond. And so what are some of the signs that you might notice? Because these, this can be hard in the transition because you just lost a pet, whether it was illness, sudden, like sudden death, whatever cause happened, you're worried about your other pets in the household. Are they sick? Are they going to pass away? Like that's a huge concern. And so you might notice some of these symptoms that are similar to other like disease symptoms. So typically you're going to see decreased appetite. You're going to see decreased energy levels. So they're acting more lethargic. You might notice your pets wandering around the house. So they're looking for their companion. They might whimper or cry more. They might ask for more attention. And so you also on the opposite end of the asking for more attention, you may notice that your pet doesn't want attention where they used to, and they're spending more time alone and sad. So the biggest thing is, is give them the space However, if you're worried about them, you feel like they're losing weight or they're just not getting better, or you're noticing like symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea, those are not symptoms of grief. And you need to make sure that you take them into your vet to get assessed, to make sure that there's not something more going on. As we know, and as I talk about a lot, our emotions, so stress, anxiety, grief, if those go on for a period of time, that can lead to disease. We're talking about that tomorrow in our webinar for de-stressing with your pets. So if you're finding that your pet is not improving and they're getting worse or they're displaying some of those other symptoms, you need to get them in because they might have been just right on that tipping point where something was brewing inside, but they were managing it and they weren't showing symptoms. And now all of a sudden with the changes and how they're feeling, they're, it tipped their body over into that disease state now. So keep that in mind. So what can you do to help those pets? Routine, routine, routine. This is key for us too. And this is something that's really helped me as I've moved forward. I'm nowhere near healed. I am nowhere near past sadness. Obviously I cry when I read a poem. Like there's a lot of grief and grieving that I'm still doing. However, my morning routines have not changed. We still go for a walk where we walked thin. We remember where he loved peeing, like where he loved sniffing. And it's hard. It is hard, but it brings a smile to our face. And we can talk about gratitude. What are we great, grateful for? What are those happy memories? What were the silly things he did? He was a silly dog. If you saw any of my videos or anything, he's crazy. That's why I loved him so much. However, the other thing is, is what am I grateful for every single morning writing that down? That is very important important when we're grieving. And a lot of times what happens is, is we go into that depression stage and we feel like there is nothing good in my life and we forget everything else. So your pets are the same. They may not be able to write in a gratitude journal. However, their routine needs to stay the same. If we start messing up their routine, we're not feeding them at the same time. We're changing the amount of walking that they're doing. They're getting less exercise. That can affect them and it can make their grief last longer and it can also affect their health. The other thing is, is give them lots of TLC, so tender loving care. Now keep in mind, some of these pets don't want it. And so if you're having a dog or a cat that just kind of want to be left alone, let them be. 
you know, see what they need. Maybe they want to, like a cat wants to play with a laser pointer for a few minutes rather than like 30 minutes if you let them. Maybe that dog, you know, he used to like getting petted, but he just wants to kind of sleep on his mat and just chill out, let them. Now, if you have a dog that is like craving attention, is being really pushy and needing more and more and more, remember, we don't want to create separation anxiety and other anxiety behavior problems. But what you can do is make sure they're getting enough exercise. So they're burning that excess energy and make sure you're initiating that attention on your own terms so that we're not creating problems in the future. And just like us, don't rush the process. So as long as you're not seeing those other symptoms like diarrhea, vomiting, things that could be a sign that there's something more going on, let them rest, let them be, let them grieve. Just like us, every person is different. And a lot of these pets that grieve, they should be getting back to more of a normal routine by six months. Some less time and some take a little bit longer. But if you're finding, you know, those other symptoms are just get them checked out, have blood work run, make sure that there's no other, you know, physical ailments. Getting a new pet can go good or bad. Remember, it's a new family member. So a lot of animals have to get used to a new family member and create those new routines. But a lot of times, especially if you have a dog that wasn't the leader of the pack and you lose a leader of the pack, now you have a anxious pup that's left behind and not and fearful and not confident. Getting another dog can make the world of a difference for them. I'm not advocating if it's something that you don't wanna do, but you may notice that those pets recover faster if they're not confident and they are kind of a little bit more fearful. Getting another dog where they can feel confident again and have that companionship can make the world of a difference for them. What are things that you can do? So self-care is so important. And there's an acronym called MEDS and RX. I'm not saying take your Xanax and all that. If you need it, please see a doctor. I'm not telling you to take it or whatever. But if you're not getting past, you know, the, the depression phase and you're not able to function in life, you need to go see a doctor about that. However, these things can work tremendously for your self-care. And it's something we should be doing right now anyways with everything that's happening in the world. So notice that I don't have an N in there for Netflix. That is like small amounts is fine, but Netflix all day, no, don't do it. <laughs> so your M is gonna stand for meditation. I am a horrible meditator. I, I know I should do it. I don't like it. I don't like silence. It's even more silence. However, meditation can look different for for every person. It doesn't mean that you sit in silence, close your eyes, and you're sitting there for an hour. It could mean that you are doing a walking meditation. You are walking, getting exercise, you're getting fresh air, and you're just letting yourself be. The emotions come in, you let them go. The fear comes in, you let it go. And so that's, there's no judgment, there's nothing. So that for me, like more active meditation is what feels right to me. However, we have to give ourselves the space to relax and let our thing, like let ourselves be. Exercise is key. Exercise is different for everyone. Remember, all of these things can be different for everyone. So exercise can be going for a 30 minute walk. Exercise could be doing a high intensity exercise routine. It could be going for a run. It could be lifting weights. It could be swimming. It could be biking. The key here is that you wanna get your heart rate up because when you exercise, guess what your body does? It releases endorphins, and those are the things that make us feel better. So every time I go for a run, it's hard because I run along where Finn and I walked, but I feel better. I feel my heart rate got up, I got some oxygen and sun, and even when I work out on our treadmill down in the basement, his little box toy is right there, and that's hard seeing that but I know I'm taking care of myself when I do that. Because if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of the rest of our pets and the rest of our families. So keep that in mind with the self-care. We should be doing this regardless of whether or not we've lost a pet, especially when there is so much darkness and stress and anxiety in the world right now. These things can really help you cope. Diet, diet is key. If we're eating trash, we're gonna feel like trash. So what, are, what, what is a good diet? Getting your fruits and vegetables in, you know, not processed food, 
if you turn the box around, for one, it's in a box that's processed, but if you can't read the ingredient list, like that's a problem. So make sure you're getting those vegetables in, you're getting those phytonutrients. It's just like our pets. It helps reduce inflammation. It makes us feel better. We feel less sluggish when we're putting less processed food into our bodies. And we're also creating less inflammation, which helps us over the long run. And sleep, sleep is key. Making sure that you're getting enough hours of sleep in a night. I suck at sleeping, I'm not gonna lie. It has just been an area where I don't do well in. Two o'clock is my time I wake up in the middle of the night. However, having your set routine where you're going to bed at certain times, you're waking up at certain times too. Keeping that routine. What are your nightly routines? Are you watching Netflix? Are you on your computer? Are you on social media looking at how many people died today from COVID? That's not going to help you sleep at night. It's going to create more stress, more fear, and anxiety. So that's your meds, meditation, exercise, diet, and sleep. What do your routines look like? Are you feeding yourself appropriately to help support yourself? And then the RX portion your R, your relationships. Right now it's weird, right? We're all online and we're all on Zoom calls, but we can jump on Zoom calls, which is cool. I've actually like seen more people than I would have actually seen previously that are in other states because of Zoom. I can see their beautiful faces and we can seem like we're together. Yes, it does not replace being in person. However, send a video message to people. Let them know how you're feeling you know, reach out to them, see how you can support them. When we help others, I know I feel better, even when I'm grieving. And yeah, it's your relationships are key. And I have an exercise that we're going to go through um, in a couple slides that can help hone in on what relationships are key and going to help you during this time of transition. And then the X factor. So it sounds like really kind of crazy and sexy, the X factor. So supplementation, that's all that is. So what is, what are you supplement? Are you supporting your body? Like we all do not get enough out of our food, especially if we're eating processed food. But what are those supplements that we can implement into our diet to help support ourselves? So right now with viruses galore, our immune system talk, what are the things that support our immune system? Vitamin D, we've got vitamin C, of course, zinc. Those are like the foundation of supporting our immune systems. And then also with extra stress, we want to be using things like adaptogens. So rhodiola, ginseng, so we can drink teas, lavender, chamomile, calming teas. Those are great at bedtime. They can help with stress too if you're feeling wound up. Herbs and essential oils are fantastic at helping our bodies calm down from extra stress medicinal mushrooms too. So shaga, reishi mushrooms, we can add those into the diet or we can get them in supplement form. Um, there's some amazing teas out there that incorporate that in and they actually taste really good and that can help support you too during this time that you need the extra support. So this is our first exercise. So if you have a piece of paper, great. If not, don't worry. This is one of the PDFs that you're going to get that outlines it a bit better than I can on the slideshow. And so this is gonna help you outline what you enjoy doing, what brings you happiness. So once completed, you can put it on the fridge or somewhere where you can see it. And then when you're struggling, what you wanna do is take a look at this list and it'll be a, a little something that you can do for yourself. So you wanna write down 20 things you love doing. So they can be big things like, I love traveling the world, I wanna to go to Italy, the Mediterranean, I wanna to go to Costa Rica, or it can be small things like reading a book. Like, you know, I haven't read that book that I bought a year ago. I want to read a book or a chapter. Or, you know, what are those things that you love? Going for a walk every day. Rank the five you love the most and then check those that cost $5 or more. And then place an A next to those you prefer to do alone or a P with next to the ones you prefer to do with people. Keeping in mind right now is weird. We can't do much with other people, but if you have a spouse or family members, this can be something where you start implementing like daily walks with each other if you enjoy going for walks with other people. And then record the time it has been since you last did that activity. So now more than ever, it's really important to focus on, okay, what are the things that make me super happy that I love doing? Because we need to do more of them. And the great thing is, is by checking the ones that cost five or more, 
So you can do the ones that are like free by like getting outside and it doesn't cost anything for you to do things that you now love. So I will send you the PDF in an email to make that exercise a little bit easier for you. But I definitely recommend doing this because this is something that if you're having a real difficult day, look at it and go, you know, I love when I talk to my best friend, I'm just going to call her, right? She'll love it too. I'm sure she'd appreciate hearing from you. This is the other one. This is another exercise that I will send out to you guys also. So this is called the Rolodex exercise. So research suggests that those who have someone they can go to for help with practical tasks, someone who will listen without judgment, or someone who will help them take a brief respite are more likely to be better adjusted in their bereavements so after losing someone. Few can serve in all of those roles, and many can serve in at least one or more. So the Rolodex can help you identify those in your life who you can call on for specific types of support. So this exercise, so this helps you identify and enhance your support network. Remember the Rx of self-care is relationships. You guys are doing amazing at caring for yourself right now because you're seeking resources by being on this call, which I truly appreciate. Having the right people in place when you need them will enhance your healing. So what does this look like? So when you'll, I'll send this all to you so you can take a look at it and it'll go more into detail about it. But your respite figures, so these are the friends that you can rely on to participate with you in enjoyable activities. So these are the ones you usually would go to dinner with, go for a move, like a walk, go to a movie, um, maybe play a board game, Cards for Humanity over Zoom. I see some of my friends are doing that. So yeah, there's a lot of creative ways you can make this work for you in this crazy time. The listeners, those are the ones who can listen without trying to fix anything or tell you their story are the ones who can hold a space that allows you to say and feel whatever is needed. These are the ones who can listen with little interruption, judgment, or interpretation. So these people can sometimes be few and far in between. You don't want people telling you how you should feel. Remember, everyone is different. You want someone to just listen and just be a safe space. Then the doers, these are the ones you can trust to get things done. So organizing, yard work, cooking, cleaning bills, other practical tasks. So if you're finding that you're not able to do these things, you can rely on these people. You can call on them and have them help you out. You're going to X off your list or limit access. So like X off your list or limit access for now. So these are the setting your boundaries people. These are the folks that require more energy to be with than what you have available at this time. This is your time to heal. So we all have friends. We all have family members. We may even be this person where sometimes it's a lot of energy that you have to extrude to be around them. They take up a lot of time and energy. And at this time when you're grieving, it is best to say, you know, I'm good. I actually just need to take some time out and that's okay. It's okay to protect yourself. You need to protect yourself more. So remember, there's nothing wrong with creating clear limits around time and activities. And you can think of clear boundaries as helping them help you. So when you're finished doing this exercise and the, the sheet will have more examples and kind of how to work through it, you're gonna identify your top few for each cat category and then just try scheduling at least one R, so respite, one L, a listener, and one doer interaction each week. So right now, Zoom, but once we hopefully go back to a more normal state and seeing people again, this is really important. Your relationships and your network are what help us heal. Being alone and by yourself does not heal. Remember, we're already feeling more alone. Our pets have passed. We feel the quietness we feel alone, we need to surround ourselves with those people that help heal us. Okay, so one of the things too that I didn't mention on here is that there's a lot of memorials that you can do for your pets. And so this is our section where we're gonna go into some of the amazing pets and honor their, their lives and their memories. And then we'll open it up um, and see what questions you guys have had. Also, if you want to share any memories, I would love to share those with you. Um, the biggest thing too is there's a lot of really neat things that you can do for your pets once they've passed. We got a nice little box for Finn and his ashes. Uh, our, one of our amazing friends sent us this photo. It's a sketch, like a pencil sketch 
of Finn and it's beautiful, looks just like him. So you can have people do these things to create like a pet memorial. You can get trees, like a plant a tree. You can get the little stones that have their names engraved on them. I've done wind chimes too. So like a pet memorial wind chime. So every time the wind blows and you hear it, you think of your pet, they're with you. And then there's also one of my clients recommended a glass blower where they can take some of the ashes and incorporate that into a like a little statue type thing that you can put on a desk and it's beautiful. So there's a lot of different things that you can do to memorialize your pets. So this next part, I will probably cry. And there's my disclaimer, my warning. Um, but I wanted to share these beautiful pets that have done so much for so many people. They're all different. We all have different relationships with our, with our pets, but the stories that some people sent stories. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the stories that um, some of my clients and some of my friends have sent through so that we can look at their pictures and hear the amazing things that they did in their life. And I will probably cry. So just <laughs> bear with me. Uh, first, I want to, one of my clients and a friend sent through a poem that is really special to her. And she actually just lost um, one of her older dogs to cancer recently also. So from the silence of your pain, I heard my name. And on the wings of light, I have come to see the sadness in your eyes that cry without tears. Can you see me? I am here. I will always be near you to calm your shattered heart and to make you smile at the memories. Do you feel me? Perhaps a soft brush of fur. You ache to believe it's real, but you're afraid to hope. You brush away a strand of hair, but it was I whispering. I am only here for but a moment. The silver thread gently quivers. I will leave behind my love in a dream when you awaken without really knowing why. Your heart will know at last that it is all right for now to say goodbye. So I thought that was beautiful and I wanted to share that with you all. So this is Gus. He was the amazing beloved pet of Dr. Erica Fallhaber. She's helped us, my family personally, navigate our two cats with cancer. She is an amazing pet oncologist and has a huge heart. And this is her amazing Gus that she recently had to put down from kidney failure and he was older. This is the story that she wrote. Guster, Gus, Gussie, Gus Gus, Gustopher, Sir Gus, my main man, my snuggly pup, my other half, my best friend. Just over 14 years ago, when I was 19, you came into my life as a six pound, six week gold puppy and have been by my side ever since. Thank you for tolerating me through my early 20s cheering for the Hokies with me, consoling me on April 16th, 2007, when the world felt so dark, and supporting me through all life's failures and achievements. For being best co-pilot on our long road trips, never complaining about the music selection, sharing goldfish with me, a poor undergrad student's training treat of choice, which continued to be one of our favorite snacks for being the one constant through every major milestone in my life, college graduation, vet school, engagement, internship, residency, marriage, purchasing a home, welcoming two kids, for driving cross country with me three times, moving between multiple rental apartments, houses and state to state, Virginia, New Jersey, New Hampshire, California, New York and Colorado, with your sweet face and kind soul, you gain friends and fans across the country. Thank you. For truly being the best dog, easy to train, never getting in trouble, really no help in preparing for motherhood. Happy to run outside and hike seven to eight miles or just chill on the couch. For accepting and loving Joe, maybe more than you love me. For trying to teach Bruin to be a good dog, you did your best, some things can't be fixed. For helping raise your cat brothers and being patient with your human siblings. For being my shadow and following me everywhere. I mean everywhere. To bed, to the bathroom, while I shower and get ready. 
Maybe you did prepare me for kids after all. Thank you for being so easy to love, for making it impossible to imagine life without you, for making saying goodbye to you unbearable, for leaving behind the biggest shoes, for any future dogs to try and fill, for being my once in a lifetime dog. I will love you forever and miss you always, my best friend. Erica, thank you so much for sharing Gus's story with us. He sounds like he had an incredible life and left some amazing, incredible memories. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay, the next one is Gidget and Cricket. So Sarah is a wonderful client of mine and I had the pleasure of meeting both of them briefly when I worked at the clinic. And so she left some information about them too. So I'm gonna tell their stories that she wrote. So Cricket came to live with me when she was six months old. She was a litter of one and the breeder could not keep her. I was in love with this little sweetheart. Less than two years later, her mother Emily had another litter, this time of two. At four months, the breeder asked if I would like the little girl and Gidget came to live with me as well. This picture, which is the one in the middle, is the day I picked up Gidget and she met Cricket for the first time. It was a true family reunion. The three were in love with each other for the rest of their lives. The sisters slept together, played together, cooled off after a great hunt competition in super hot weather. They were truly inseparable. Then sweet Millie joined our family. Rescued at four years, they included her in everything. They all loved each other, but the sisters had a very special bond. They even shared their bed until a month later. Cricket dying of hemangiosarcoma. Gidget stayed with her even though she was blind and suffering from her own diseases. The next day Cricket died while laying on the porch swing and Gidget only lasted three months without her. Thank you for giving me a reason to look through these once more. Remember my sweethearts and give Millie a hug through some tears. Sarah, thank you for sharing your beautiful fur babies with us. Oh, okay, <laughs> so this is another dear friend who shared some pictures of Hops and Belle, and Zook is still with her holding down the household. I know Hops passed away from cancer and was a huge, huge loss to the family. And they made many amazing memories um, with my friend Ginger. So thank you for sharing these beautiful photos of them. You can tell how much they loved each other and the way they look at you, you can tell that they just have so much love to give. Uh, so Marcy shared these photos today with me. This is her little Dobie dude. And he actually passed on Wednesday. Uh, he was hit by a car. So he was a, a sudden loss. Uh, he, they did emergency surgery with him. Unfortunately, there were complications and they had to put him down. So Marcy, I know that was really difficult. And thank you for sharing his, I can just see how amazing he was and full of life and energy. And I know that you gave him the best short life that he, he could possibly have. So thank you for sharing these with us. And Cindy, thank you for sharing your beautiful photos of Kenai Darwin and Ariel. I had the pleasure of meeting Kenai, the little black lab on the right. And I know they definitely did not have enough time with you and you did so much for them and you are amazing pet parents and thank you for sharing their beautiful photos with us. And Jenny shared this with us this afternoon. This is her sweet Izzy. So Izzy passed on April 7th and sounds like she had an amazing life. She looks like she was a little older. I hope she had many, many years with Jenny, I know she mentioned their border collie is truly, truly missing Izzy. So I hope that some of the things in this talk can help with your sweet border collie, helping um, mourn the passing of your, your girl Izzy. Thank you for sharing these photos. And last <laughs> but not least, and the most tears, um, this is Finn, this is our beloved Finn. So he was almost 12 years old. He would have been 12 in July. And he, we got him as an eight, eight week old puppy in New Zealand, went to vet school in New Zealand. And so he was a world traveler. 
came across the on a plane with us to Colorado and lived an incredible life. Uh, he had a super fascination with massive sticks, like that stick in the top right, way small. He would have preferred a tree, no joke. And he unfortunately was diagnosed with a brain tumor 10 months ago, he started having seizures. We did a CT scan and diagnosed that. However, he had an incredible life. He had some bouts of seizures in between then and now. And we made the decision last Tuesday to put him down after he was just not improving and getting worse from seizures. However, he's, he's my mission, he's my why. And he's why I do all of this because there's people like you guys, you are incredible pet parents that need our support and the education. And I want to make sure that your pets have the support that that I can provide through herbal medicine, holistic medicine, and just by being on these calls and creating a community, you are not alone. And I cherish every single one of you for being here and taking the time and allowing me to just be upset. <laughs> so you all understand. So that's why I'm not afraid to show emotion. Every single pet that, I, that a client loses is a pet that is lost to me. And I feel every single one. So um, all right, the resources. So this is something you can go back to. I'll make sure that I share this with you all. So you'll have the recording. You'll also get the resources, those two exercises that you can do to help you process your grief and also create that support network that's truly gonna support you during the difficult time. There's a lot of great information in all of these. I went through and there's just a lot. And then I also included on the bottom. So I don't do horses. I don't I do dogs and cats for veterinary care. However, horses are amazing animals and I know a lot of people also have horses. So there is a resource, the hoof beats in heaven that if you do have a horse that passes, that's a great resource to check out. Um, as everyone knows, you know where to find me, social media. We have an amazing pet parent membership. Check out our website. If you're not on our weekly newsletter, make sure you are, because I would love to make sure you guys can access all the amazing content that we put out most of it's free to you guys. If you have any questions, if you need support, remember I'm here for you. Send me an email, katie at the naturalpetdoctor.com. If you feel like you have no one, you're not able to handle your grief, I am here for you. There are people that can support you and help you and provide the resources and I'm one of them. So please reach out. You are never alone. This is hard. Unfortunately, going through this is not fun. Um, so thank you, Marcy. Thank you for sharing your beautiful pup with us. So I hope you are all doing well. I know right now is a really, really weird time and you are not alone. That is the biggest thing. And make sure that you are taking care of yourself too, because that's how we get through this. There is hope. Things are weird. They're different. They're going to be different. However, by following your, your meds and your RX, take care of yourself so you can take care of your pet. And we're gonna be talking a lot about stress tomorrow in our webinar, de-stressing with your pet, because that's a big thing. There's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that we're managing that stress and that anxiety and coming out even better after this whole thing calms down. So I love all of you. Thank you so much for taking the time out on this Friday afternoon to be here and reach out with any questions, comments, concerns. If you need help with your pets, I would love to help you. All right, take care, have a great, rest of your weekend. This is Dr. Katie Woodley, the National Pet Doctor.